How you doing tonight, IB Nation Sports Talk? It's the Friday rapid fire. That means, of course, well, if you're watching this, you know that we're on, you know, at five o'clock. I don't have to tell you. With Vince D'Addario and Jesse Styers, I'm Sean Styers. How's everybody doing today? Double thumbs up for me. <laughs> okay. It's uh, it's right. Friday and it's payday in this household. So Ooh, nice. This one. And there's Very margaritas nice. after uh, uh, working out tonight. Apparently, we're meeting up with some friends for some margaritas, some chips and queso. So even better, we get through this. I get a little three miles in, sip a couple of margaritas, and I'll go to bed. Oh, to be young right. again. All right, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. I'm just going to ask a question um, right off the top tonight. First, Derek starts off. You know, let's have a good show tonight, boys. My uncle's mom will be listening oh. tonight. Okay. Uncle's mom of Derek. We'll we'll see if that's actually true. But then he says, "Did you see Joe Montana's tweet? You think he really listens to this show? I, I need I need some explanation. What's that all about? Are you just dragging us here? What's what's going on? Isn't your uncle's mom your grandmother? Uncle's mom. Yes, that actually would be, wouldn't it? Okay, just check it. I had to think about that for a second. Well, deduction, Vince. Good deduction. Well, I well done, well done, Derek. Because I had to think about it. <clears throat> made us all think <laughs> uh, but uh this whole joe montana's tweet i i went and looked before we started up the show for joe montana tweets and i saw nothing that yeah, I uh, see nothing maybe you know, relates to anything so uh, i'm i'm guessing Derek is just dragging us with his grandma out there so <laughs> his uncle's mom that's right <laughs> <laughs> although i guess it could be like an uncle by marriage, and that could be... That's fair. It, that would not be your grandma, but... Right. Like, do you call, you know, aunt and uncle? Like, like, do you call, you know, like, if it's an aunt or an uncle by marriage, you still call them aunt or uncle? Yes. Right? Absolutely. And it's aunt okay. Kathy, or, you know, by first, right. first names, aunt, uncle, whatever. Yep. And I probably, when I was a kid, I probably didn't even know who was actually married in and who wasn't. They were all just aunts and uncles. <laughs> yes. Like I, I have, you know, aunts and uncles who have divorced and, you know, like I still, even though I don't see them, I still, you know, because I grew up with them, right. like basically right. from tiny, basically, you know, like into teenage high school years, that's, that's a long time. So I still kind of, you know, considering my yep. uncle, even though they're not married anymore, it especially took me... considering the guy that she married afterwards, it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> It took me about 10 years before I figured out a guy that I called uncle was actually a cousin because oh. <laughs> that's just how it was. Like my dad felt like he was like a brother, even uh -huh. though they were cousins. And so he was an uncle and I didn't even know he wasn't my uncle for quite some time. So yeah. See, yeah, Jesse is. is like, he's got, you know, one uncle, two aunts basically. <laughs> and that's it. The family, the family tree does not <laughs> just branch very far. That's right. So he's a smaller he's family. Very, whatever. It's okay. All right. Well, hit that like button. If you would, we do appreciate it. It helps out Irish breakdown, subscribe rate review and all that good stuff. We've got plenty of topics to get to tonight. So uh, let's not waste any time. Uh, Notre Dame still searching for an offensive line coach right That's now. We talked about former Georgia offensive line coach, Matt Luke earlier this week. He interviewed in town this week, but as I Irish breakdown has reported, Luke plans to stay retired. He's not coming out of retirement after uh, retiring after helping Georgia win the first of its two national championships. The uh, the names on the radar now, Virginia Tech's Joe Rudolph and A.J. Blazik from Vanderbilt. I think that's how it's pronounced anyway. Scale of 1 to 10, how you feeling about all of this right now? Vince, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, they're going to find somebody. There's going to be plenty of people knocking at the door, you know, that want to coach at Notre Dame. I mean, and and especially this this specific group, the offensive line, they're elite. Who would not want to coach this elite group, right? 
I am about a seven, I would say, as far as where I'm at with everything. If they could have landed Luke, I feel feel very similar about Ludwig, Luke. Like, man, home run. Like, this is going to be a home run hire. Mm-hmm. And then I get disappointed. So, you know, I, I so I'm going to put it at a seven because I was at a 10. And I felt really good when I saw him and his family walking around Penn High School you know, getting the golden, getting the, you know, rolling out the red carpet, getting the treatment, right. you know, all, I felt really good about it and only to be let down. So I'm at like a seven. Yeah. I, I echo kind of similar things that Vince was talking about there. Originally you, you see Matt Luke and you see the resume and what he's done with Georgia and, you know, the recruiting abilities and things like that. And it lines, you know, with what Notre Dame has set as a standard or tradition at Notre Dame for offensive line coaches and offensive, you know, offensive linemen in the NFL. Um, You know, there's a lot of pro bowlers, all pros, et cetera, future hall of famers that are in the NFL that played at Notre Dame. And when you lose someone like Harry Heastan, uh, obviously that's a big blow. And so you try to find someone who can fill kind of those large shoes. And Matt Loop felt like someone who wouldn't entirely fill the shoes, but would make you feel comfortable I'm pretty with, close. Yeah, make you, yeah, exactly. Feel make you pretty close and be pretty you, you would feel comfortable about that kind of transition. But then now when you lose him, it's also kind of like what Vince was talking about. It's like you're flirting with these kind of bigger names only to be quote unquote let down a little bit. And so I, I'm gonna be in that same kind of area of a six or seven. It just feels like at this point it's going to be, you know, both those guys, Joe Rudolph, AJ Blaze, like I can't say that I know a lot about them. Um, but it, it, again, it's just not the name or profile of Matt Luke. So naturally you're going to fall down to like a six or seven. And I think that it's an underlying or kind of underspoken thing that, that has predicated a lot of Notre Dame success is the consistency in their offensive line and the guys that they're getting to the NFL. So you want to see that continued success on the offensive line. So I am a little bit worried and I am about at a six or seven on the scale right now. Yeah. And you know, like looking at what Salty was saying, he feels like Charlie Brown tired of getting the football yanked away at the last second. That's, That's kind of what, kind of what it feels like when you look at what happened with the OC and and with this now. Because, like when you when you think about offensive line coaches, and it, you can say this, I think about a lot of assistant coaches really, in especially in college football because there are so many coaches. But you know, like we didn't really know any who had heard of Andy Ludwig before the whole search process started and how excited sure. were people oh, absolutely. Then, you know it's like it looks like he's becoming the guy people get excited and then the football gets pulled out and especially yeah. with offensive line coaches you know like who knows any of who, who any of these guys are until these search processes start like even you know Harry Heastan was not a universal you know he's gonna be great hire when he was Hired like remember he was coming from the Tennessee Titans and all that stuff and he had been around and how good is this guy really well he turns out to be a rock star of offensive line coaches like Matt Luke was the closest thing to a rock star yeah. when you start to look at his resume and it's like wow and so really anywhere you go from there I think it's going to be a considerable drop like but again you know like you look at at these guys they've they've both got experience both Rudolph and Blazek, if if they are truly the guys, and we're going to talk more about Jack Swarbrick in his live chat, but you know, here in a few minutes, some different topics. But this came up in the live chat, the offensive line search. He said, "We've got three quality candidates, you know, something along those lines," and you know, they're excited about who they've got. So it's just, I don't know. I it, like I, I l- let's say this if. If Luke was still in the running, I'd probably be at a nine. But the fact that he is not in the running, and you've got a couple of guys who you you know basically got to dig up as much research as you can to find out about, it's like yeah, I'm at a five or a six. I think you know you, you hope they're going to find somebody good, but you just you don't know, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's I mean, look, based on everything that I know, this was a hundred percent a family decision for right for Luke and how all that went down. And and look, if I'm being honest, if I'm, if I put myself in the, in the shoes of if his 11 and 15 year old sons, right. They live in Georgia and play and they're big into baseball. And that like that, that is what I was told by the school officials. And that was the push. Right. And 
look, Penn won the baseball state championship last year. They're a really good baseball program, no doubt about it. But are they really better than what they have to offer down in Georgia where you can play year round? Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's a big part of it. If, if sure. you're ba- like travel baseball in the South and the set, you know, like that whole corridor down, basically warm weather States travel baseball down there is a completely different life than travel baseball exactly. up here. And I mean, they're, they're in the thick of SEC country, and who runs right. college baseball? Just like they run college yeah. football for the most part, the SEC. So, like, they're in that phase of their life. Why would you want to have to come to South right. Bend, Indiana, or you know, Granger, what you know, whatever you want to call it, and have to play baseball in basketball gyms? You know, yeah. for for half exactly. the year while, while you're getting ready for your season. And, if that's and I'm guessing. Thing. You know, there aren't a whole lot of baseball, like turf baseball fields down south because they don't need to have them. And that's a different brand of baseball is playing on turf. I mean, it's just if his family, if it was truly about his family and he gave them an equal opportunity to decide whether he was going to take this job or not. I would am in no way surprised that he's not the next offensive line coach at Notre Dame. Just not because those kids would have had to give up a lot to come up here. No yeah. doubt. So you know, now Notre Dame has to turn the page, right? And if Jack Swarbrick said they had three guys, well, then we know the names of the three guys, right? And so a couple of questions were in the chat about, you know, are there any NFL interests, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Probably at one point, but they've narrowed the list down to three. One is off the list, so they're down to two. We'll see where it goes from here. But as of right now, no, there's not NFL guys on the short list that I can tell. Yeah, Paul says, as fans, we can see this one of two ways. Notre Dame is finding hungry up-and-comers, or Notre Dame can't land a big fish. I'm going with the former, but only for my emotional <laughs> wellness. Fair. And, you know, it 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 definitely seems like, you know, that's that's part of the problem. Like, when you look at the perception after the Ludwig, regardless of whose side of the story you want to believe or whatever, when you look at that and then you shoot high – for a guy like Luke, anything is going to be settling, basically. And that's right. like no, no, no program wants to have to be told, well, we've got to settle for this, quote unquote, you know, in in the eyes of right. the public, I guess. But that's that's kind of what it it seems like right now when you don't get your first sort of big candidate. But that's also why they tried to keep this as tight lipped as possible, because they didn't want names getting out exactly. there and having people find out, you know, that. Someone moved on and all that kind of stuff. But hey, when you know, like you said, Vince, when you're out there in public and you're you're in the school and you're doing a tour of the school, someone's gonna see that. And a lot of people saw it. Yeah, there's only 3,600 students and about a hundred faculty. So, you know, this, you're gonna get seen by somebody. And it was the size fairly of obvious. a small college, basically. Yeah, pretty much. And so yeah, I mean, again, I'm disappointed. But after him, I mean, again, five days ago, didn't even know who that was, right? Yeah. And it's the same situation with Ludwig. Didn't even know who he was. So we'll that's exactly it. And they might be, you know, again, like you look and you, you know, like you look at Blazik, like he, they're at Vanderbilt and he came in and they ran the ball better. I know some of the running, you know, is attributed to the, to the quarterback they had, but that's still Vanderbilt, and you're in the SEC, and you improved your rushing total. And like you go back and and you look at some of these other spots that he's been, you know, like in in his write up on the on the Vanderbilt site, they made a big deal about the time of possession and all that kind of stuff that that they improved. I mean, you know, in college football, what's that probably mean? It probably means you're running the ball pretty well, you know. Well, I, I agree. But <laughs> well, yes, you're right. It does mean you're running the ball a lot. Yes, that yeah. you can absolutely infer when it comes to wins and losses. That's a different conversation. Yeah. John R said, just hire Chris Watt. He's a he stand disciple. And following up on that, Eric said, what's the negatives from placing Watt in the position? Experience. I mean, that the, the negative is going to be the experience and that that's going to be the argument that is out there. Is he ready? He's been a a full-time offensive line coach one year, and that was at Tulane. The rest of his coaching experience has obviously been under Harry Heastan, which I think everybody would be on board with. And playing under Harry Heastan as well. And 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 playing in the NFL. connection. He's been here. Yeah, he played in the NFL for a little bit. If if anyone is going to be 
sort of the next Harry he stand, you would think it's going to be Chris Watt, especially sure. since he got and, to work with him for a year. And to be honest, I thought that was the succession plan when Watt gave up a full-time offensive line mm-hmm. coaching job at Tulane to come back again and be a GA at Notre Dame. I thought, it, you know, Harry will be here three, four years and then just hand it off to Chris Watt. The problem was Harry left after one year and they got to decide if Chris Watt is ready for that challenge. And I guess the other side of it is you just promoted internally for the offensive coordinator True. after this highly public thing blew up. Do you want to promote internally again? You know, how much how much does that matter? You know, ultimately, if Marcus Freeman thinks he's the right guy, I think that he would make the move. But at the same time, how much does it matter that you'd be promoting from within again? Like, to me, what has always seemed like if there was going to be an exception to the lack of experience because of all the things that we just outlined with his background, who he's coached under, who he's worked with, you know, he stand, he's basically like the he stand understudy and maybe Harry hung it up a year or two too early but it seemed like at some point Chris Watt maybe was going to be the guy maybe you know again maybe it just happened too early though well and and you know uh, Salty says ND may have to promote him so he doesn't leave it's a chance you're gonna have to take the man's not gonna be a GA the yeah. rest of his career I mean, yeah. and just wait out the job at Notre Dame I mean that's that that's not realistic frankly I mean Eventually, he's going to leave, and he's going to go be an O-line coach someplace if he's not going to be the O-line coach at Notre Dame. And the way it sounds, it doesn't It doesn't sound like he's a finalist. So I'm sure he's weighing his options right now, as I would be. Yeah. Shytown asks if we have a preference on who's hired an offensive line coach. And I mean, look, you know, again, like, looking at who these two guys are, like, I'd probably lean a little bit more toward Blazik, you know, just based on I would too. what I've seen about his background that that, would be it i mean take that for what it's worth i mean i haven't dove into the film and all of these other things i I let brian do that for me and then i read what he has to say and i form my own opinion based on the numbers that he gathers and things of that nature Uh, the preliminary stuff that i've seen i agree with you sean i think that he would be the better pick but at the end of the day I just think that this O line is really, really talented, and I'm I really hope that whoever they bring in no, isn't but, so bad that they go the other direction. Well, that's got to be the main concern is that right. they establish this precedent, and you 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 can't regress at this point. You have to continue to to progress or to continue that climb. And I think that's that's why you can't just bring in somebody. It's got to be someone who can you know fill the shoes, continue to recruit, bring in those big guys every year, and not see any decline in the offensive line play. That that's that's exactly it. You you can't regress at this point because, you know, again we we've, we've been through this before where they pro you know, again it's like we've got the BK PTSD because of all of Brian Kelly's mistakes that he made with things like this that is being applied toward Marcus Freeman, and Marcus Freeman has to prove that these hires are worthy. You know, to some extent, some of these guys have, but every time. You hire a new guy, especially if they're coming from within. That's like a whole nother proving ground. And what I think we said this earlier this week or, or last week, what you can't have now going into year two under Marcus Freeman is you can't have these growing pains out there in public where you lay massive eggs against teams that you should beat. That has to be a thing of the past now. You know, like you got you got a one year reprieve on that. There's going to be a lot less forgiveness going forward anytime something like that happens. And when you're making these hires with unproven guys, sure, you, you, it just just from a number, you know, like Jesse is the true numbers guy, but from a numbers standpoint, you are at least going in until they prove otherwise, you are increasing the odds that those kind of things can happen again. All right. Well, let's go to some of the Jack Swarbrick conversation. What do you think? This was interesting. I will say yeah. that much. It's one of those things. It's like it pops up. It's like, oh, he's he's doing that. Really? Like, where did this come from? You know, and like the, the next thing you know, there's a full video out there on YouTube of it. So Jack is staying current with the times. He is. Something like that. He did a live stream chat yesterday, answered a number of moderated questions. This came from a moderator, Lou Nanny. Lou has been Lou Nanny, who's been there for a long time. At Notre Dame, the video is up on Notre Dame's YouTube channel. But uh, 
Here's, for starters, what Swarbrick said on the subject of NIL. Quote, what we want to do is ensure that they are true transactions, not pay for play. We're just not going to go there. We don't need to go there. But true transactions in which the student athlete engages in something, does something, lends their name, lends their image, but importantly, as you point out, lends their ideas, lends their intellectual firepower, end quote. Again, that's from Jack Swarbrick from yesterday. So, Jess, uh, I, we, we can start with you on this one. Are you good where with where Notre Dame is in the NIL space, or are there any changes that you would like to see? Yeah, I, I'm pretty comfortable with where they are in the NIL space, and I like that the, the few things that Jack reiterated, one, most importantly, the not pay for play. I'm not on board with cutting blank checks to guys and saying, you know, what's it going to take for you to get here in order, you know, to play and to get you on the field. And another thing that I that I liked that he reiterated is, you know, most importantly, how can they lend their ideas or an intellectual firepower? Because at that point, I think you're starting, you know, a path of entrepreneurship. You're, you're creating avenues for, you know, things that potentially could lead to, you know, things outside of football, because I've talked about it before, you know, that a very, very small percentage of guys go on to the NFL and a very even smaller percentage will come out of the University of Notre Dame. So what are you doing in terms of your education and avenues uh, to kind of you know, set yourself up for the future? And I like that Jack Schwarbrick has introduced introduced that Notre Dame student athletes can offer their intellectual intellectual you know, uh, name, image, and likeness, as well as their athletic name, and image, and likeness. So I think it's a really good point that he reiterated. And I, I to, to kind of conclude, I don't I don't see anything that could really be changed because the main thing for me, again, is that you're not just cutting blank checks for people to play. And I think that Notre Dame has plenty of, you know, uh, local kind of partnerships uh, that they can, you know, help these guys uh, get up, get set up with. I don't think there's a lack of resources or, you know, potential partnerships for these for these athletes at Notre Dame. You know, I I am all I'm all on board with the way Notre Dame handles NIL. And I think that they're handling it the way that NIL was originally intended to be. I, you know, when they came up with NIL, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be paying all these 17 year old kids to come to your school. That's not what NIL is supposed to be. That's what it's turned into for the vast majority of the people that use it. But mm -hmm. I think Notre Dame is using it in the way that it was intended. And I, it's one of the many reasons that I am, obviously I work, follow Notre Dame, but I'm also a Notre Dame fan first and foremost. And it's why I like Notre Dame. They You wouldn't be doing this if you weren't a fan of Notre Dame. Well, that's fair. No, you're absolutely right. And I, I, I am happy that they are sticking to their guns in this realm, right? In this space, because I, they're doing it the way it's supposed to be done. You, you and I, and Jesse, we don't get paid to just be around, we get paid to do a job. You do a service, you get paid. Like that's the way it's supposed to work. And I don't know, maybe it's selfish of me, but I think that's how NIL should work also. Yeah, one of the things I found interesting was he also said that only 40% of uh, of all of the athletes over there at Notre Dame, regardless of sport, only, only about 40% participate in NIL because he said, you know, some of them were like, oh, I'm too busy. You know, I don't have time for that, whatever. And I, I wish, I wish we knew more, like, I'd like to see the breakdown. Okay. So how many football players are involved? Right. You know, like if, if there's a bunch of football players that are involved. right. Cause I think there are 700 plus, you know, total, you know, across all the sports over there, I think is, is the number that I saw. I'd like to know, how many football players are involved right. and how many they really, players, yeah. how many, whatever track. Yeah. And they don't, they, they don't do a lot to publicize any of this. And, you know, like the, the one thing that they want to publicize is the fund F U N D Brady Quinn's thing, the friends of the university of Notre Dame. And that's great. You know, I think it's a, it's, it's a nice little thing. You like, if you want to do community service type stuff, whatever you can do it. And, you know, then you get some money back on, on the back end yeah. out of this fund. But like to me, like I would like to see them promote other things that they are doing. It would be right. like one of the one of the few things that I've seen, you know, like every once in a while, maybe you see something on social media. Um, and I think I mentioned before I saw a couple of basketball players do. Uh, do there was it was 
it was like a car you know like one of the car wash commercials or something like that there was like a local commercial that they did i just i'd like to know more i'd like to actually see more about what they're doing because it just doesn't seem like it's out there very much it seems like this kind of cloak and dagger kind of thing honestly you know like notre dame wants to keep telling you well it's there but unless they're out there doing community service type projects and i, I know like nate lashevsky was the latest to get out and do something and you know like jd bertrand put on that big you know um you know the bowling event that we talked about back right. before the season started you know, he was kind of the spearhead for that but there were a lot of different athletes from different programs who were involved in that as well but i i just i i'd like to know more about what these men and women are actually doing in the nil space you know i think i think that would help maybe with some of the understanding of what exactly is going on at Notre Dame. I think that's fair. I think a little more transparency would be good. I know they're they're trying to keep it on the down low for whatever reason. I, I don't understand why, because you can still stick to your, you know, you're getting paid to do something. You can stick to that and have no problem with it. But let's, what are you doing? What's everybody doing? And they, they publicize the fact that they're doing this community service, which it's not really community service if you're getting paid to be there, but that's a different conversation. Uh, but they they publicize that these guys are all out doing this. We know that they're getting paid to be out there. But be up front. Like, talk about it. You know, this is what they're doing. This is what we've got so-and-so doing. This is, you know, I don't understand what the problem with that would be. But you can still stay true to what you believe in and how you operate in the NIL, you know, landscape. Right. It's not like we have to know, like, what these guys are making right. from their NIL. Right. Just like... Again, if they're doing NIL stuff, I, I actually think it would be kind of cool, you know, because like from a media standpoint, there would actually be, you know, like potential storylines that we could follow with some of these guys and ask right. them about it from exactly. time to time. But it's like you have to, you know, like really, you know, hey, are you doing anything with NIL? You know, that kind of stuff. Like, like um, Braden Lindsay, remember at the at, at one of the media sessions he had late in the season, he's like, oh, the. The NIL stuff is wonderful here at Notre Dame. And it's like, well, what's Braden Lindsay be doing in the NIL space? Because I can't name a thing off the top of my head. Yeah, right. 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 Okay, so Swarbrick also, again, he talked about some other topics. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Swarbrick said this about football, creating a general manager type position. Quote, we're also going to look for a person to sort of lead the whole personnel side of the player process. Recruiting, development, sort of a general manager for roster purposes. It'll help bring a lot of different pieces together that sort of aren't necessarily connected as well as they should be right now. End quote. Vince? I don't think it's a problem. I, I feel like, you know, that job is... Well, I, don't, of... I, don't, I, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm saying that like oh. it's a problem, but... Yeah, no, no, I think it's a good Go idea. I mean, and, and the fact... So the really only the thing that's regulated in, in college football is how many coaches you can have on the field, right? Other than that, you can have as many support people as you want to have. And frankly, I kind of dig the idea of having a general manager type position. I, I think I think it makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like a buck stops here kind of a situation. And I'm mm -hmm. I'm fine with that because right now, you know, it's a collaborative situation. You know, okay, defensive line, you guys are gonna get eight spots you know or whatever whatever they you know and they they figured okay this is how many spots we have on the roster for quarterback wide receiver tight end offensive line etc 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 if you have somebody and it's their sole job to make sure that everybody's staying where they're supposed to be what's the best thing for notre dame you know all of that kind of a thing and then you add in there some development and recruit you know all of, i think it makes a lot of sense frankly and it takes some of that extra stuff off the plate of the position coaches and allows them to just be position coaches, which I do like as well. Yeah. yeah so I think it's an innovative idea, but it also in my, uh, like most things has pros and cons. So the, the, the immediate pros that I think of are kind of what Vince was talking about. You are able to allow someone to strictly, you know, focus on, you know, that we're looking to recruit eight offensive linemen. They could essentially do a lot of the filtering process, report back to the offensive line coach and say, hey, here's the profile of players I found. You know, which guys are you interested in? Now, can you go make these visits, you know, with whoever, you know, goes along with visits or whatever. So 
I like that idea. That's the number one pro. Um, I also think that it it give it takes a lot of stuff off Marcus Freeman's plate, and I think that's the biggest pro of it all is it lessens Marcus Freeman's load and allows him to get you know strictly to coaching, day to day management, practice management, game day management, all that stuff. Um, but we all know Marcus Freeman is a big time recruiter, so how much he wants to give up of that is you know to be determined. And that that kind of leads me to my con to the situation is. I wouldn't want it to create some sort of hierarchy type issues, because when I think of GM in professional sports, you know, you think of guys who are scouting, negotiating contracts, trades, they manage salary caps, they hire and fire coaches. They're like the direct extension to the owner. So does that create hierarchy issues where, you know, obviously I don't think that Marcus Freeman would be reporting to the GM, but in traditional terms, Right, he would be, and so does that create, where does this fit in the hierarchy? You assume, right. where does this you assume create, that because it's football that the head coach is still going to have say over it? Yeah, in, at the college level, at least, right? right? Because right. it's still amateur. So that would be my only concern: is does it create some sort of division of powers, hierarchy issues? But if all those things can be ironed out, where you know specifically the GM has this task and he still reports to you know Jack Schwarbeck and Marcus Freeman at the end of the day. And I think it's a great idea, and I think you could lessen the load of a lot of guys and allow them to free up to just do more coaching and the X's and O's, O's of things. Yeah. Like, you know, again, like, where where does this fit in the pecking order? Is it essentially an assistant or associate athletic director who would have complete oversight over the program and the head coach? Or would it be, you know, more like, a, I think I've seen Dave Poloquin's, you know, like a you know, an operations, you know, a little bit more pull than an operations yes. type. I mean, guy. he would be a perfect person for the job in my right. opinion, but we'll see. Right. So where, you know, where exactly does it fit in the pecking order? But, you know, kind of what you were saying there, Jess, it, it makes sense for a coach who is as involved in the recruiting as he is to help take some of these, you know, all, all of the, I guess, the details sort of yep. off his plate like you go focus on okay you know we'll, we'll set your schedule up or your calendar up or whatever these are the people that that, that you need to go see on these days you don't have to get bogged down in the right. details of all it's like that. a macro Just, versus micro situation in yeah my opinion. yeah exactly so i mean i think it makes great sense and like like when you hear something like a, about a position like this you know obviously like and i've already seen some people bring up brian polian but that's kind of what he's going to transition to at LSU. We talked about earlier this week. He's not going to be the special teams coordinator. He's going to do that. But like, I think more of the SEC, this seems like an SEC type position, you know, like all of these different positions that have been created in different sports down there in SEC land. This, this definitely seems like, you know, that's along those lines. And so for Notre Dame to, to create a position like this, but you know, again, it's, it, I, I think it's great. What's the stature? Where does it fit into the whole pecking order of things? That's that's kind of, I guess, the next question. They'll get all feel, that figured out, but I am yeah. curious, just like where it. I f- where yeah, it falls I feel like he would field. be like the head of the off the field people. You know what I mean? Like I don't feel like this GM position is going to be right in charge. So maybe of it's off to the side and a little bit below right. the head coach kind of thing. Yeah. So if you're, if you're doing like a flow chart, right? right you'd have you know. Jack Swarbrick, then you'd have Marcus Freeman, right? Then you'd have all the assistant coaches over here, and then you'd have the GM and everybody over here. Mm-hmm. Like, it would just be like a separate kind of a deal. I could right. definitely see that, that being sense. the case. That would make sense. You know? Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, it's going to be curious where they go with that and, you know, to, like, exactly what extent, you know, like, what the pay structures, you know, all those different kind of things in terms of the kind of person they're going to, you know, because like I saw Tim Brown and it's like, well, if you want a brand ambassador for Notre Dame, Tim Brown is great. You know, as, as Chi-Town brought up, he's already running like, I think it's, what is it? Like the arena league or something? Some indoor. Like, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Like he's, he's got a lot of stuff on it, on his plate. He's running some other stuff as well. You know, I'm like, like Joe Montana. Well, you know, that'd be great. But you know, the, the other part of it is, you know, they're going to have to, this is a, it's going to be a full-time job. So it's not like you can do whatever concurrently with this. And it's not like you're just a, 
you know, brand ambassador for Notre Dame, no. whether it's Tim Brown or Joe Montana or whoever it happens to be. It's an actual important job yes. that you're going to have and, if you're going to be you know, part of it. Montana specifically doesn't he I have like a you know he's got all kinds of other he's got his toe dipped in a lot of other pools mm-hmm. out in California he's not coming to Notre Dame to work under Marcus Freeman and be the GM of the team that, that's never going to happen it's great right. thought never going to happen yeah and I don't even know if he's qualified I'm being honest I mean, he's a smart guy but is he qualified for that Good position point. would he want to do it like no guys that's not you're not going to get a name in there doing that job. Yeah. So Swarbrick also asked about the NBC TV contract. He complimented NBC for the job they do promoting Notre Dame, specifically mentioned the 92nd, um, you know, what would you fight for PSAs and, and all that kind of stuff. And he went on to say, quote, we need the financial resources to compete with the schools in the Big Ten and the SEC. That's a given here, that as we enter into – New negotiations, we have a very specific goal of making sure we reach those levels because we want to compete. I think that one of those reasons to be encouraged is that everybody who does a broadcast agreement today, NFL or anybody, understands that part of their inventory will be streamed as opposed to carried on regular television. And NBC with Peacock is a great streaming partner. End quote, again, from Jack Swarbrick. So when you hear that, Do you think Notre Dame is more likely to stay with NBC when this contract is done after 2025 or that it's truly going to open up the bidding and we'll find out about this? You know, I'm going to take the charge on this one because I'm excited. (laughs) I had something queued up for this. I know you'll get this one, Dad, Vince. I don't know if you'll get this. Vince, did you ever watch the TV show Entourage on HBO? Nope. You got to pay for that. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so I'm re-watching it now for the third time. Timeless classic, one of, probably one of my favorite series out there. And I'm in like season three right now, and Vincent Chase has just fired his, his firehouse agent, Ari. And okay. during this process, you know, his, 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 his boys, his entourage are saying, you know, before you fire Ari, you need to find, you need to go essentially go out and flirt and see you know, what you can get out there in the market before you right. determine that you're just going to end everything with who you got right now. And I think this is an, a perfect, you know, parallel to Notre Dame situation. I don't think that they're ever going to get rid of NBC, but when they go out and flirt with different agencies, they're just going to drive that number up even further for what I think NBC potentially has to pay them. And I think going out there and flirting does nothing wrong with, uh, with helping out, you know, getting more money at the end of the day and assuring that NBC has their commitment to Notre Dame. So at the end of the day, do I think that it's all smoke? Sure, but I, I don't see anything wrong with going out there and flirting a little bit, seeing testing the waters, and then being able to say, hey, NBC, you know, you, you got to match this at least because how are they going to turn down more money at the end of the day? I agree with you a thousand percent, and I also agree with the fact that Jack is going to do that. Like he's not just going to blindly just re up with NBC and whatever they offer. I don't see that being the case. Look, Jack Swarbrick is a lot of things. And I realize he's not everybody's favorite human at the moment. And I get that, but he has proven himself that he makes very, very good business decisions for Notre Dame as a whole. He does. Right. And, and there's a track record there. And for the so most do, part, like that I drop do. in stock price of Under Armour from when they signed that deal to where it is now. Well, That's it's a pretty precipitous fall. But you know, Under Armour stock was doing really well. I was gonna say you can't really predict that to really be. Really could have foreseen I mean, I, where it is you know, right now. But yeah, that, that pulling up quite really, a bit. Can't really predict that, but I, I will say that he's gonna take it and he's gonna shop it around. I mean, come on, of course he is. He's not just gonna blindly take whatever NBC offers. No, for sure. I don't think that he's going to blindly take what NBC offered. But like you always hear, like the references, oh, we we love what NBC has done for us. And part of it, as we've talked about before, is is the partnership and the input they have. Like when you talk about the fact that Notre Dame has never had to play these noon kickoffs like the Big Ten is doing, part of that is because of the partnership that they have with NBC. And like I talked about, I, I don't know if we actually talked about it on the show or not, but I posted it on the boards earlier this week. I talked to to someone, you know, with direct knowledge at Notre Dame 
after the press conference the other day, the Jared Parker, Marcus Freeman press conference about people keep asking us about what's going to happen with Notre Dame's primetime football games since the Big Ten is going to have all these primetime football games. And I was assured that that is taken care of. Notre Dame is still going to get its two primetime games per year. And what I was told is you can, you can, you know, probably guess what this year's two games are going to be Ohio state and USC. So, you know, like that, because they've got such a long relationship, they've got a good working relationship. Now, some of that is comfort level, you know? So again, like when he talks about, they've got to be competitive with the big 10 and the sec, you know, he's, he's talking about dollars there. He's saying we've got to get big money in this contract. So, you know, for like what Jesse said, you've got to go out there and flirt a little bit if it's going to drive the price up. But the other side of that is if you get a, an offer that that makes sense, that meets all of your criteria, you've got to be willing to pull up stakes and say, OK, 30 years, this this deal is better for us, you know, as as you go forward. So I, I think I'm kind of right in the middle on what exactly is going to happen, but it still seems like. Because another aspect, you like he brought up the streaming thing in Peacock, which, you know, again, it's like people aren't that thrilled with. But I do think you have to have a streaming element. But like, you know, we were talking about the Pac-12 and Apple TV and all that stuff this week. It can't be the only element. That's for sure. Like if you're Notre Dame, you still have to be on broadcast TV because it reaches, you know, I think it's like five five and a half something like that times you know bigger audience potentially than you know like a streaming service for example no I, and I, I get that you need to be partnered with a streaming service but why not simulcast it why not like it doesn't have to just be on the streaming surface like i don't get that and i don't like the fact that it's on peacock obviously if they go with CBS, does that mean that there's going to be one of the games that's going to be on Paramount Plus every year? If they go with Fox, is it's going to be, you know, whatever, whatever the streaming, because all the networks have a streamer, right? Whichever their platform is, yeah. Right. So is that what that means? So let's, okay, let's say that they they do go with CBS, for example, and they put a game on Paramount Plus. People going to bitch about that the same way they do about Peacock? Probably. Paramount Plus is more expensive than Peacock. I would. Last well, and I not checked. only that, not only is it more expensive, like there's there's so many different factors that are involved. And like the, you know, the big the big thing, the first time that when the, remember when the Toledo game streamed is there's a huge difference in the stream compared to broadcast TV in terms of the delay, you know, like the lag. Sure. I think it was 30 or 40 seconds behind. And sometimes, you know, depending on buffering and stuff, it even got more than a minute behind and we've talked about the functionality and you know switching out in and out and what you know what you you know getting in and out of the app and all those different things so like streaming to me is like that's that's like your last resort personally absolutely broadcast linear tv is still the best place to be because it reaches the bigger audience but you know again at the end of the day the question is going to be how much your broadcast partner is willing to work with you on certain things you know like as Jack Swarbrick said, promoting the Notre Dame brand, obviously, during these products or during these broadcasts is big, even though I think that there, you know, is more that can be done than just a 90 oh second gosh, PSA yeah. during the broadcast. And, you know, and and the money that you're going to get, that's going to be a huge part of this, because, again, if Notre Dame is not going to go to the Big Ten or the SEC and get a guaranteed hundred million dollars a year from a TV contract in one of those conferences, you have to get at least pretty close to that, even if you're not, you know, even if it's 70 or 75 percent of that as a as a standalone independent university. There's still a big paycheck that's going to have to be signed. Yep, absolutely. And, and he'll shop it around. They'll get a big paycheck and it's not going to be like the Big Ten because it's one team. Right. So, I mean, people have to understand that as well. They don't need it. They also get a kick in from the ACC. And I know people think that Jack's an idiot for going with the ACC, but you have to understand the rest of the sports at Notre Dame and they do need a home conference wise. I mean, that's, that's still a thing. And so they're never going to go to the big 10. So who else is Notre Dame supposed to go with conference wise that makes sense for the rest of the sports. So that anyway. Yes. (laughs) All right. Uh, What else do we have now? 
You know, actually, I, I came with another question today. I, I'm actually really prepared. Uh, with yeah, the women's are. basketball regular me. season ending this week, do you guys buy or sell Olivia Miles as the ACC Player of the Year? Now, I know this is a really good question for you because you have attended, you've seen every ACC player in action. So I came up sure. with my list of five who I think are the Look finalists. Okay. And I want you to confirm or deny that list, and we can kind of okay. you know, go off of that Do list. you want to go you from mind. there then? Okay. Yeah. So my list is Elizabeth Keatley for Virginia Tech. I'm. Okay. Yeah, she'd be on the list. Haley Van Leith from Louisville or Louisville. Right. Your pronunciations suck, but you're, you know, you're, you at least know who they are. I'm I getting it was Van Lith, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Van Lith and Kitley. <laughs> I just remember that from hearing you call the game. Like I'm not even looking anything up. I, I have nothing to add to this except for that. So <laughs> okay. go ahead. You're two Olivia for two. Miles, so yes. Notre yeah. Dame. That's three the three. obvious one. Uh -huh. uh, Tania Latson from Florida State, the freshman. Yeah. Um, and then my last would be uh, Deja Fair from Syracuse. Um, she's probably, she would belong in that number five spot. I, I do think it's a four person race with the first four people you mentioned for sure. Okay. Those would be my top four fair. Fair is a really good player. And I think she's the second leading scorer in the conference right now off the Correct. top of my head. Behind Latson, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. The, and they actually, they sent out the ballots last night. So I was doing some of my research on you know, who's where in stats. And we have to name 10 players for the first team, 10 players for the second team. So there's a lot of players. It's like, you know, again, like you've seen them all, but it's like, you you know, you especially once you get to that second team, you have to work and you have to rank them. So like whoever is number one on your first team ballot, that's who you're voting for, for player of the year, you know, and the points kind of go, based on that, how many first place, second place, third place votes they get. To the question of Olivia Miles, and again, Jess, those top four, I think, were are, are spot on. I buy her as the ACC Player of the Year for really a number of reasons. First, Notre Dame's tied for first place in the conference going into the last game of the season, and her play is really a huge reason why. You know, like, she doesn't have the big – 18, 19, 20 point scoring averages that some of those that's other that's not her role. No, exactly. That that some of those other people that you mentioned have. She's, you know, and she's not averaging a double double like Kitley from Virginia Tech, who was the player of the year last year. She's a point guard. And what do you expect the point guard to do? Get her teammates involved in the game. And she does that. You know, she's leading the conference in assists. She's also ranks number six in the nation in assists. You know, and you talk about crazy passes and dazzling plays and all that stuff, which is part of her game, obviously, but it happens because of the court vision that she has and, you know, the sense for where everyone is at all times. It's like, you know, I'll be sitting there and it's just all of a sudden here comes this 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 pass and here's a player cutting to the basket and it's an easy layup and like they come, you know, whether it's Citron or Bransford or, you know, Westbelt, whoever, they just come cutting out of nowhere, but Olivia knows exactly you know, when, when they're making the cut and, you know, it's not a team that's built around a dominant post player. She's just distributing the ball and literally doing, you know, not just a little bit of everything, but a lot of everything, really. She's the only player in the ACC who ranks in the top seven in the conference in scoring, rebounding, assists, and steals. And she's number four in the conference assists. Again, she leads or in steals and she leads the conference and assist. And then, you know, then you look at the results that are, you know, like they have head to head wins over all the teams who's got those other player of the year candidates. And in a couple of cases, like in Latson's case specifically, those players did considerably worse when they played Notre Dame in those games. So, you know, then you just go to the eye test. You know, a great player when you see one. And, and Miles is a great player and she's, you know, leading one of the top two teams in the conference. So I think she should be the player of the year. Yep. <laughs> no, I look, I watch a lot of the women's games it, selfishly because I like to hear Sean do his thing. And the thing about Olivia Miles, and I and I'm I can't even speak to anybody else. I'm gonna talk about her specifically, but the thing about her, she is a true point guard, like you guys said. She she can distribute, she finds her teammates, she's an one of the best passers of the basketball that I've seen at the collegiate level in a really, really long time. She can thread the needle 
and she sees things happen before they happen. It's really, really impressive. But if she has to, she can take over a game and score. Like right. She can drive to the basket and get to the hoop and finish better than an awful lot of people that I've seen play the game. So she can kind of do it all, right? Late game heroics, assists. She can score when she needs to. She's an emotional leader. You know, all of those things. How is that not your player of the year? I concur. Yeah, so I'm going to go into, you know, to me, this boils down to a four-man race. I are you going like to bring, you gonna bring out, out your graph now, Jess? Or are you going to, like, I, I If people chart? can see my screen, I have some good notes written down. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of Haley. Van Lith. Van Lith. <laughs> Be, strictly because Louisville isn't the team of Louisville of the last few years. And I think team success has a lot to do, you know, with what you got going on. So I'm going to remove her. Well, I mean, I, and I think that's fair because they're, you know, she was there last year and was a good player last year, but they're not as good this year because of a couple players they lost from last year's team. That right. Went to the final four. Exactly. So that, that narrows it down to a three man or sorry, three woman race for me. Um, and then from there, I think Tanaya Lat Latson is obviously going to lock up ACC freshman of the year, right? Yeah. And so I think that kind of takes her doesn't. off the table for that too. So to me, it comes down to Kitley at Virginia Tech, who won it last year, and Olivia Miles this year. And then so you start looking at rankings. You know, Notre Dame is two. Virginia Tech is three. You start looking at all-around game. You know, Kitley has the 18.4 per game, 10.7 rebounds per game. That's a walking double double. Like that's that's hard to do. That's very impressive. She's you know, also got a lot of block shots. I was gonna say yeah. she has 2.0 blocks per game, which leads the ACC. So she's your typical true dominant big down low. She gets it done scoring the blocks, protecting the rim, you know, the rebounds, that sort of stuff. But then you start looking at Olivia Miles. I saw I, I found a stat that was interesting, kind of similar to what you were talking about. She is top 10 in nine different categories within the ACC. That screams. All around well, player. She's got 14.7 points per game, 7.4 assists per game, and 7.0 rebounds per game. That's almost a walking triple double every night of the week. And if you remo remove her from Notre Dame, they're going to be a lot worse off and potentially not be, you know, second place, first place in the ACC this season. As a point guard, she is leading one of the two best teams in the conference in rebounding. Think about that. As a point guard, correct. As a point guard. And so the, another comparison I would like to make is. <laughs> There's two of them. I didn't one, realize this is going to be a book. <laughs> one is well, you got to look at you know the the parallels to the NBA right now. The last two back to back NBA MVP Nikola Jokic, he's a walking triple double. His game aligns with Olivia Miles. You look at someone like LeBron James in his game, his all around being able to score when he wants to, the assists per games, the rebounds per game. And you lost me. That's that's <laughs> just a, to me in terms of a great basketball player. You can do all things. Well, and I think that that parallels to, like I said, Nikola Jokic and what he's done and potentially going to be, you know, this season he's averaging another triple double and he's leading the MVP race. So I'm all on board for Olivia Miles. I think she means more to her team and she also does more in terms of being an all around basketball player. That's really all you had to say. Was that last sentence? Well, <laughs> I'm a factual That's guy. Very well thought out. Good. It was. You backed it up. You Spent backed it up. I like that, man. <laughs> you did. I'm impressed. Spent a lot of time. All right. How about the men's basketball side? Fill in the blank. It's blank that Tony Kornheiser said on PTI that Rick Patino could take Notre Dame to a final four if he were to be hired here. I'll start this one. Bold. <laughs> Short and quick to the point. It's bold that he said that because Notre Dame has gone to the final four one time in history, 1978. So to say that one man can walk in and completely double the amount of times that you have been to the Final Four is so drastically and dramatically, I think Kornheiser forgets what it kind of takes in order to build a good basketball roster at Notre Dame. So I'm going to say it's bold, and I don't necessarily agree. It's something. I mean, it. It to me, <laughs> it is in – it's in lockstep with the people that wanted to bring in Urban Meyer. Would you have automatic success as a football program? Yeah, but you'd probably get a lot of other crap to go along with it. And I just feel like that would be the case with Rick Pitino. Would, they be, would they be good? Yeah, they probably would be. But I, is it the Notre Dame that you want to root for? I don't know. So are you selling your soul for wins? 
that was kind of like bringing an Urban Meyer here towards the end. Is that what you want to do with your basketball program? That's, that's exactly what it would be, Vince. It would it would be Notre Dame selling its soul, and you can't you can't be Notre Dame and extol all these virtues right. and then hire a guy like Rick Pitino. He was fired <laughs> for a recruiting scandal at yeah. Louisville, and even before the recruiting <laughs> scandal, there was a sex scandal. Remember that? Where he cheated on <laughs> yeah, his. That's why I was just like Notre Dame is not going to bring in a character like not this. a chance. Yes. <laughs> his resume of past mistakes outweigh his resume yes. of coaching every time, especially when you consider. Notre Dame and I'm not that's not you know saying that Notre Dame is better than this or keeping your nose above everyone or you know all that stuff it's just it's just facts Notre Dame's not going to hire a guy with those personal issues on his resume right a lot of coaches him. who can win games but not everyone is an institutional fit for Notre Dame there you and go that's a good way to put it Tino's not an institutional fit no no he's <laughs> not all right Maybe Aaron Rodgers came out of his darkness retreat this week <laughs> He was emerged in total darkness for like either three or four days, allegedly, depending on, you know, whatever. But no phones, no nothing. Total darkness in this room. How long could you guys stay in a room full of total darkness? That's what I want to know. Oh, man. So total darkness and no children, no wife. Like, you've got nothing. It sounds good. It sounds good. It is you in the darkness. Apparently, you know, like he had a bed and a bathroom. You know, I don't know. And and I guess. And a film crew, from what I understand. But just. Oh, really? Out. That's now, what see, I heard. Now, that, now, that's the interesting. That's, that's what I heard. The way he was describing it going in, it was going to be kind of like, you know, like solitary confinement where there's like a slit in the door and they, you know, like slide your food through to you. You know, those kind of things. So. So like prisoner of war the film, the film crew <laughs> changes a lot like, uh, but it's Aaron Rodgers so let's yeah. let's just let's just go for the you know I was gonna say utopian ver you know like yeah, whatever the you know the uniqueness of it if it was no total me, darkness you're in a room yeah and you get your meals through a slot every now and then <laughs> sounds like prison yeah. uh just like Jesse said it's it does sound like prison it sounds terrible I could do it for a day and probably be just fine because I would probably sleep the vast majority of that time. Catch up on four your days. Team. I think I would start to go insane. So, and it has nothing to do with like not having my phone or not having a digital device, but not having any opportunity to speak to another human being would be very difficult for me. I would need at least need some human companionship. The sunlight, eh, whatever, but I couldn't go four days. I don't think, I think I would go nuts. You know, first it was the ayahuasca retreat. Now it's the darkness retreat. <laughs> first and foremost, I think a, a lot of this is predicated by the temperature of the room. Put me at like 65 degrees in a nice, cool environment. <laughs> <A> nice <comfort. laughs> you know, Naomi's leaving for a week starting on Monday. I think Henry and I could, could last in there for about a day or two. I'm with Vince, so I couldn't make it for four days. But just solitude, not worrying about work not worrying about, you know, everything else that's going on, complete darkness, complete comfort. I could make it in there for a solid day and feel good. The second day I'd start to get a little bit antsy thinking about, ah, like I want to, you know, kind of naturally just see what's going on in the world, kind of have some sort of, like Vince was talking about relationship or, you know, just speaking right. with someone um, and just drowning in my mental thoughts for two days wouldn't be, you know, the most fun thing <laughs> in the world, but you know, four days I couldn't make it. One day I could definitely make it. Two days would be the the extent of how long I could make it. Yeah, I think I think one, you know, maybe one and a half because you know, like you talk about not needing your phone and all that stuff, and that's that's one thing. You know, just just like the, you know, like you said, Vince, it's like I would sleep, but then at some point, you know, it's like you can't fall back asleep and I'm so reliant on my watch. I don't know about you guys. It's like, you know, my watch, the clock, whatever. It's like, sure. What time is it? What am I doing next? All these different things and not knowing what time it is, especially when it's total dark all around you. It would be, I think I would think that like after a day <laughs> in that you would just be like, what time is it? Should I be asleep? Should I be <laughs> awake? Should I be frustrated that I'm not falling asleep? <laughs> Right. right now, all those different. Yeah, things. that's I, fair. I don't, I don't think after a, much after a day, I could get past that. Because Plus, if you just... took like a little notepad and pen with you, like naturally, you're going to be able to see at least up like in front of your face. So you could 
doodle, write down some thoughts. Like you could, you know, you could play hangman with yourself. I don't know. I don't know. This is such a look at me moment for him. Like it is. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. That's, uh, you know, I understand the whole like disconnecting and getting away from everything and like, but it just seems like he always takes it to that next level and he wants everyone to know that he's doing these crazy ayahuasca darkness retreats. Like he can't just do it for his own personal private re- reasons. He's got to let everyone know that he's on the yes. cutting edge of this new retreat technology. And that's what it is. Yeah. He has he to let everybody know everybody. about it. He loves you the fact go do that, that stuff. everybody's talking about him. Yep. Yeah. You want to go do that stuff? Peace be with you, man. Like you want to go to yoga retreats and do all the you don't have to talk about it to everybody. Just go do it. Just go do it. And that's that's the part I have an issue with. Like, we don't care, but people do care. And now we're talking about it because he's look at me. I'm going into right. a dark cave. <laughs> Ooh. We did have somebody, I think it was DJ. We do start at five o'clock on Friday. Speaking of the clock, so every Friday, someone said that came Friday, in late. Brian let out a disclaimer that it was at six. So uh, that might be yeah. Brian must have let it, you know, off the top of his head, forgotten himself. D Hawk Orioles win a hundred or Royals lose a hundred. Better chance. I'm gonna go Orioles win a hundred. They're close. Oh man, not a, not in the Good east roster. I don't think the Royals are going to lose a hundred, but I don't think the Orioles are going to win a hundred quite you gotta yet. Pick one. I you gotta pick one. That had um, Adley. I'm, I'm gonna. I can't. You know me and names. Rat, the, the catcher for the Orioles. He he got called up last year. He's already in like the top twenty best players in the MLB. So I'm curious to see what kind of season he has. He gives me big Buster Posey type vibes. A catcher that can hit really well, and obviously a, a Salvador uh, Perez type. Oh, uh, not is it not, Adley Rushton or something like it, that? R- Ruch, or I can't. Uh, Looks like I, I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking about. I, I only know because Google just told me Adley Rutschman. There you go. I was close. Yeah, it's R U T S C H M A N. So it's it is a difficult one. I think bull take. I think the Orioles have a better season than the Red Sox. I think it's gonna be between the Orioles and Yankees this season. You're gonna write the Blue Jays off. You're, You're right, right though. It's just probably the hardest division. You know, the Rays have really good pitching. Uh, the, Toronto's got really good offensive power. They got Vlad, you know, Junior, Bichette. It's it's hard to it's hard to say. And then obviously John. the Yankees that could just pay everyone. Welcome to John. We just <laughs> we just did this with DJ. John's getting in late. We're getting ready to wrap up the show here in a little bit. Of course, don't forget you can always go back and either go back. Just go you back. Know, go to, Go to your Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you know, wherever. Just pretend it's live. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sync um, up the video. Couple quick offensive line questions since we started off talking about Matt Luke and the offensive line situation. Matt Luke deciding that uh, he is not going to come to Notre Dame. David, do you know if there are any NFL O line coaching candidates besides the two college coaches you mentioned, and also. I- uh, B feeder ND 08 AK Toe Jam 1992. I wish Andy Heck was an O line option. Um, I mean, right now there there are no viable candidates who fit that profile, and it's just between the money in the NFL and the fact that you don't have right. to recruit in the NFL once you've been there. It's just yep. very prohibitive trying to get those guys to come to college. Yeah, and I, I was there anybody with NFL experience on their long list when they first started? Probably. But they narrowed it down to three guys at this point, and all three are college guys. And as yeah. far as Andy Heck is concerned, I mean, he's the offensive line coach for the world champions. Like, I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon. No. That's what everybody, you know, as soon as it's like, oh, Andy Heck, he just won another Super Bowl. He, he went to Notre Dame. Well. Sure did. Been coaching in the NFL for a long time. So did Condoleezza Rice, and she's not coaching yeah. the O-line either. That's right. That's right. I mean, you, you know, you might, you know, if it's like an assistant offensive line coach who's trying right. to make his way, you know, like something like that. But again, you got to want to go to college and right and be a recruiter and and be a teacher. And, a lot you know, as we and we also saw with Harry Heastand what a difference it is mm-hmm. being an elite college football offensive line coach and trying to go to the NFL and apply that. They ran him yep. out of town in a couple of years. Absolutely correct. All right, guys. Good stuff tonight. Yeah, buddy. 
we covered a lot as always yeah. like we always do jesse you're muted right now so i came with that fire on fire friday you did. I, I mean, you were all about the top ACC women's basketball players. I didn't see that one coming. I know. I know. Wasn't ready to, for you to be bringing that kind of heat. But like you said, I think those are the four. The first four that you mentioned, with Fair maybe being the fifth because of her scoring. But I like her. Her yeah, isn't good enough. I, a stat I liked about her is she leads the uh, ACC in steals. And I think that's, you know, causing turnovers, transition, for fast, fast breaks. I think that's pretty good. But – I mean, I'll, I'll leave it up to the expert. <laughs> All right. You want to turn it? You want to work on my ballot for me? I got to turn in my ballot by Sunday. That's by, a lot of work Monday what morning. you were talking about, but I like that they make you do that because one, it, it certifies that you're doing what you're, you, you need to, and you're not just blindly, you know, writing people's names down. And, and I think if you are privileged enough to have a ballot, then you should have to have you the do the work, work to, to, to submit that ballot. Yeah. I hated the season Notre Dame was in the ACC because that was way too much work at the end of the year for those ACC. Oh, that's true. We voted for, for football all that stuff too. For yeah. football, like I opened it up, I was like, nope. This is like this is harder than the SAT. I gotta, I gotta. I couldn't this back do it. In. Like I did not have enough faith in myself to fill <laughs> that out. Like logically, I was like, I can't even, I can't even attempt this. Like, I didn't yeah. even, I didn't even turn one in because I. I just, I wouldn't have been true. You know what I mean? Like, I I didn't feel like I saw everybody play, you know, the whole thing. It's like, I can't even fill this out. So I didn't. That was a lot of pressure. At least I well, felt like it's a lot of pressure. There's a lot to it. Like, at least I, you know, have seen everybody play up, at right. least once. Up yes. close. But, you know, part the other side to that is players can have an off night or, you know, they can have For a sure. good night that night and because you only see them once and in, in, in a couple of cases twice that can skew your opinion of who they are so yeah can it make bad. it tougher as well Ooh. yeah like there are going to be people who maybe saw olivia miles on an off night and it's like well she's sure. not that great she didn't play that great against sure. well especially if you get caught whoever. up with the, just the the score generation because right you know, Olivia Miles could drop eight at eight in a game, but go eight, eight, and eight. And you know, that's that's a really solid night considering everything yeah. else. Like you said, she's averaging close to a triple double. You know, like even though she's only had one triple double this season, she has been around a triple double so many times this year. All right. Well, that's gonna do it for tonight. Have a great weekend. Appreciate you stopping by tonight. Salty truth as an NIL czar GM Condoleezza Rice is overly qualified. <laughs> See what I started. I just said oh, she wasn't qualified to be the old line coach. That's all I said. <laughs> you probably would do a very good job as the uh, as the other, as the GM, actually. Probably so. But anyway. All right, hit the like button on your way out. We will talk to you on Monday on IB Nation Sports Talk.